102. Music and the Tithe. One of the aspects of modern Christian life and worship which best reveals its distance and departure from Scripture is the place of music. The role of music is now peripheral and supplemental, whereas in the Bible it is central and basic. In no other society than that of faithful Israel and the various branches of the church throughout the Middle Ages has music been so important. The decline of music is a consequence of the rationalism first introduced by Abelard. By identifying increasingly man in terms of reason rather than faith, the modern world has seen the progressive relegation of music to the background. In fact, this became precisely the role of music in the Enlightenment. The composers provided background music for the royal courts. Since then, the music of humanism has taken two directions. On the one hand, we have a highly contrived rationalistic music which explores musical possibilities and techniques. On the other hand, popular music, from jazz to rock and roll, explores emotionalism for the sake of pure experience. In either case, music represents, even at its best, a fragmented man and a worldview which is emphatically non-Catholic or non-universal, but is rather private and limited. The Bible sees music as a mandatory fact in the life of faith. It is a necessary aspect of worship and to be supported by the tithe. In Numbers chapter 18, verses 26 to 28, we see that the tithe was paid to the Levites, who then gave a tenth of the tithe to the priests. The priests thus received 1% of the tither's income. The Levites had charge of the care of the tabernacle and temple, not too great a charge, the task of education, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 10, and much else. One of their duties was to provide the music of worship. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15 verses 16 to 24 and chapter 24 verses 1 to 31, we get a glimpse of what this duty involved. David organized the Levitical chorus and musicians. As James Miller observed, the whole of the choristers and players were divided into 24 classes and are said to have been 4,000 in number with 288 leaders. Even the name of the director of the choral recitals is given. One aspect of Josiah's reform was the restoration of music. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 25 to 28 and verse 30. While the continuing form of temple music was reshaped by David, it existed from the beginning, and music was closely tied to prophetic utterances. 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 5, 2 Kings chapter 3 verse 15. The Bible refers specifically to 19 musical instruments, besides mentioning other instruments generally. Daniel chapter 3 verse 5. Peter Lorimer, in analysing and comparing the dates of 1 Chronicles chapter 23 verse 5 and 1 Chronicles chapter 24 with 1 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 17, concluded that David appointed 4,000 Levites, being a fourth of their whole tribe, to be singers and musicians in the two tabernacles of Gideon and Mount Zion, dividing them into 24 classes under the leadership of Asaph, Heman and Ethan Jeduthum. David, in stating that he appointed 4,000 musicians, adds that he created new instruments for religious use. 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 5. We have not yet mentioned a most important point. A central book of the Bible, the Psalms, 
is a book of music. It gives us the sacred songs inspired of God, which were used for worship. The command to sing is a common one in Scripture. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 5 God himself describes creation singing with joy when God laid the foundations of the earth and the sons of God, the angelic hosts, shouting for joy. Job chapter 38 verse 7 David declares that when God comes in judgment during history's course, the very trees respond with music. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 33 We cannot regard this as merely beautiful imagery. God, having created all things, all things find their truest being and nature when God's presence, judgments and grace are most manifest. Just as our hearts sing within us and we feel marvellously alive at joyful news, so too all creation responds to its Maker. In the New Testament, such statements as Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 and Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 make clear the centrality of music, not merely to worship, but to faith. Moreover, music is to be not only an expression of joy, but of faith. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Psalm 30 verse 4 A faith with poor or little music is likely also to be a faith with a weak memory for God's grace, mercy and blessings. Instrumental music is also important and regularly referred to in Scripture as witness Psalm 33, verses 1 to 5. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him with a new song, play skilfully with a loud noise, for the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness, or mercy, of the Lord. We are to praise God by song and instruments, because God is, and because the whole earth is under his government and witnesses to his mercy and judgment. The reason for music is thus transferred from man's mood to God's being in grace. While the subjective aspect of music, our experience of God's grace, our griefs, sorrows and burdens is very much present in the Psalms, it is the objective fact of God's being and majesty which must be the central fact of our music. Music is here called praise and it is comely or befitting for the upright to praise God. To withhold praise is to separate ourselves from the Lord. Our music is to be with a loud noise, with jubilation, for the word of the Lord is right. It is the exact and total word. It speaks to our every need and answers our every problem. It is grace and it is law. It is truth and knowledge. Hence, our music is to be skillful and rich instrumentally and vocally. The church has beggared itself musically, not only in its worship, but in its education, family life and private life. My maternal grandfather was killed by Turks in Armenia while on a pilgrimage as he walked singing on his way to an ancient church. It is difficult to imagine someone doing that now, which is also why it is difficult for most to see why Christian victory in the future, or any victory for anyone. Music, on the whole, has left the modern age 
except for its schizophrenic manifestations. There is good music, but it's entertainment, not life and worship. Because music has become peripheral to worship, worship has become peripheral to man. Faith today is a warped, minimal thing. Especially with Arminianism, it is saying, Yes, I accept Jesus as my personal saviour. This is the mind saying yes, with sometimes emotion added to it. About the only time modern man puts his whole being into anything is when he is radically frightened or terrified. For the modern man, even sex, or perhaps especially sex, is divorced from love, faith and reason. As a result, it is a shallow and ephemeral thing. In terror, modern man functions as a whole man. He therefore courts an induced terror by going to films like Rosemary's Baby, Jaws and the like. Then briefly, he is alive until the next time he has an opportunity to terrify himself. Again, modern man is able to be a whole man in hatred. As a result, he loves to hate. He will use love as an excuse for hating. That is, he will claim that it is his love of a minority group, of the natural environments or some such thing that leads him to hate most men so passionately. In any case, he is most alive when he is filled with hatred. In the 1960s, we saw normally apathetic and emotionally callous college youth become totally involved in hatred. Almost anything suffices to excite their hatred, and anyone not sharing their intense will to hate was, in their eyes, hardly alive. Modern man cannot be whole except in terms of evil. This is especially true of the ungodly, but it is reflected also in Christians, because their lawlessness has led to despising the tithe, God's law, and hence music. When men will not see the tithe as mandatory, as God's law, it means that they choose to retain in their own hands the initiative of approaching God. It is practical living Arminianism. The idea of supporting musicians and composers is then alien and repellent. Man then chooses to approach God in his own way and at his own discretion. The songs he then sings are expressive of his feelings rather than the glory of God. Song too is then dead in his heart. We have a telling bit of evidence of the closeness of music to life in ancient Israel in Numbers chapter 21, verses 16 to 18. Moffat's rendering best conveys a hint of the nature of the song. Then they pushed on to Beir, well town, the Beir, where the Eternal said to Moses, Gather the people, and I will give them water. And Israel sang this song. Spring up a well, ah, sing to the well, that chieftains dug, that captains delved, wielding their wands, wielding their staves. Music from its simplest to its more complex forms was basic to man's life because it was, like life, God-centred. The point of Psalm 33 verses 1 to 5 is that we sing to the Lord because his word is right. All his works are done in truth and his government, justice, mercy and grace are so gloriously right and perfect that song is the covenant man's ever new response. <laughs> 